What's going on guys? Hope this video finds you well. So back in the summer of 2022, I released my Mega Man Battle Network tier list conveniently just before the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection was announced. And that video quickly became my most watched on the channel by a large margin. And even to this day is still my second most watched video on the channel. And so assuming that a lot of you have stuck around since then and or if you happen to see this video crossing your feed and you did watch my original Battle Network tier list, I do want to thank you. It was pretty amazing to make a video on one of my favorite video game series and have that actually pop off in a major way. Now I am going to leave that original video up, but I want this tier list to be as comprehensive as possible without repeating myself too much. And so I'm just going to focus on the points that I think are most pertinent to each game as we go through them. And since the Battle Network Legacy Collection dropped in April of last year, I streamed all six games as well as on my own time playing through the alternate versions and got all of the trophies slash achievements in both volumes of the Legacy Collection. And so I did play all of these games very thoroughly. Of course, there's plenty of post-game stuff that I haven't done in most of them, but they're all as fresh in my mind as they possibly can be. In addition to that, I'm going to be ranking the Star Force games alongside the Battle Network games today. The Star Force games are different in some notable ways, but I think they're similar enough to where I do want to include them, especially because a tier list of those three games on its own wouldn't really make sense. I feel like you need more than three items to rank in order to make a tier list really be a tier list. Anyhow, I am trying to hit a thousand subscribers as soon as I can, so I can set a new goal for 2024. So I would really appreciate if you are not subscribed, if you would do so. I do have plans to talk Mega Man on the channel somewhat regularly, but I want to space out those videos so that way I don't burn through too many ideas too quickly. Because unfortunately, Mega Man is not really an active franchise, especially on the RPG side of things. But anyhow, let's establish the criteria for the tiers. I think all of these games are worth checking out to some degree, even the ones that I would rank pretty low, because you just never know. You might take a liking to a particular entry that I haven't. And so S tier is as it always is, the absolute top of whatever category I'm ranking. A tier is almost always pretty strong as well, and occasionally does contain some of my all-time favorites. It's just, I try to reserve the S tier for like the very top of the top. B tier, based on my practice ranking, is something along the lines of game that maybe suffer in some areas, but also succeed in others that do somewhat redeem them. And then C tier is going to be the games that I don't particularly care for. I'd be hard pressed to call them bad, but definitely rough around the edges. And so of course I'm ranking mainline games specifically. I've dabbled with the spinoffs a bit, but I can't say that I'm the biggest fan of them, especially compared to these. And plus the spinoffs generally play pretty differently from the mainline games. So I don't really think it makes sense to include them. Them. And of course, I'm ranking specifically the Game Boy Advance slash Legacy Collection versions of the Battle Network games, but I will mention when there is a DS version that is better, for instance, and talk about the differences there. Speaking of which, the original Mega Man Battle Network, I've played now twice in full, and I do think that I enjoyed this second playthrough more than I did my first. However, this first entry is really pretty rough. Combat-wise, it still can be pretty fun. I mean, the Mega Buster is way too strong, but of course, not being able to reliably run from battles, traversal on the net being extremely labyrinthine and confusing, to the point where I recommend looking at maps of these locations even on a casual playthrough. It's just not really something that is easily memorized unless you've played the game like a million times, which I definitely haven't. There's some other things like drop rates being really bad, specifically with bosses. There's no way to avoid random encounters if you're looking for a boss, and boss rematches have a very low encounter rate, so once you finally find them, if you're trying to S rank them to get their higher level chips, it's still a coin flip as to whether you're actually going to get it or not, which coupled with their encounter rate and not being able to avoid those lower level encounters is really frustrating and obnoxious. Although thankfully in the Legacy Collection, there is Buster Max, which does help at least clear through those random encounters to get to the bosses. But even then, if the drop rate for S ranking them was 100% and I could more reliably encounter them, I would not have used Buster Max, but I utilized Buster Max pretty heavily in the post game of BN1 this time around, primarily for the trophy that requires you get every single chip in the game. It took really long even with using it, which I didn't turn it on as early as I probably should have. But even if you are using it, it's going to take a while, man. And so how much do I want to factor in the 100% experience? I don't know, but the negatives when it comes to the 100% experience for the original Battle Network stem from problems that permeate the entire experience. And so this is going to go in the bottom tier. It laid a solid foundation, but Battle Network 2, as we'll discuss shortly, is a massive improvement and is 
way more representative of what the series continued to be from that point on. I will note that there is a DS version of the original Battle Network, although it only came out in Japan. There is an English patch for it, but as someone who hasn't actually played the DS version but knows of a lot of the differences, I would highly recommend playing the DS version over the GBA version, assuming you're not going for all the trophies in the Legacy Collection, of course, or you specifically want to play the original version of Battle Network, which I can totally understand. It's just the DS version irons out a lot of the kinks that I mentioned, where I believe there's maps on the second screen, so that way traversal isn't as confusing. I don't know if the encounter rate is lowered, but the drop rates are adjusted to be more in line with the later games, where you're just more likely to get non zeni drops at lower ranks than were required in the GBA version. And also, if you S rank a boss, you are guaranteed to get their chip, as opposed to having it be a coin flip, whether you get their chip or just more zeni. And so I could see the DS version maybe being in like the B tier or something if I were to rank it, but I haven't played it, so I'm not going to place it. But yeah, as far as the GBA slash Legacy Collection version, which are pretty identical, it's going to be bottom tier for sure. And speaking of way better, Battle Network 2 is a pretty massive improvement over the first game. A lot of those problems in Battle Network 1 are alleviated to certain degrees where traversal is way more clear, although I didn't realize how the fast travel teleporters worked when I could have used them most, but it was helpful for clearing up the remainder of the trophies as well as acquiring hub style, which I did in addition to 100%ing the trophy list. Hub style is not required, but that was generally a pretty fun process because this game introduces sub chips like Sneak Run, which which allows you to avoid lower level enemy encounters based on your max HP. Unfortunately, in the post game areas, sneak run doesn't seem to be very effective. And so encountering those bosses was extremely tedious. And so I got kind of sick of their encounter rate being so low with sneak run not working to where I threw in the gospel download ships in order to S rank Napalm Man and Planet Man. I would have done it without those, but man, after trying to S rank Pharaoh Man after so many tries and so many random encounters that I did not even want to fight, I just couldn't justify it. I was just like, just get this done. But either way, I would say acquiring hub style was generally a pretty enjoyable time. I mean, even boss fights that are notoriously tough in BN2, like Magnet Man, for instance, which was a grind for sure, but it was something where, you know, I could kind of throw in a podcast in the background. And that process really made me appreciate BN2 a lot more. This is another one where I've only played it in full twice. I've definitely started it a few more times than that. BN2, of course, introduces style changes. It does retain the power up system from BN1, where you purchase power power-ups and then allocate those into attack power, rapid fire, or charge speed, which is different than how BN3 and on handle those kinds of stats, but the introduction of style changes was pretty major. I do like in BN2 that you can retain two style changes at once. However, you need to continue using that play style in order to improve your currently equipped style as opposed to getting a different one, whereas in BN3, you can only have one style at a time, but when you have a style change, you can choose to improve improve that style without having to worry about continuing to use whatever chips or strategies require you to get that style in the first place, which I think is a big deal, especially when it comes to some of the harder to get styles playing naturally, at least based in my experience, like shield style, for instance. You don't really want to be running barriers and recovery chips constantly, right? In BN3, you can put in the work to get shield style and then not use the barrier and recovery chips and all that garbage, but continue to improve shield style nonetheless. And so there's pros and cons to each. I personally would prefer if you kind of fused both together where you could retain two styles, but also choose if you want to improve your current style or search for a new one and get the best of both worlds out of that. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. And so I didn't mention BN1's story much because it is very villain of the week. And yeah, those villains of the week are working for World 3, which is the overarching organization, but it doesn't really feel like an overarching story. And BN2, while retaining that villain of the week structure, tells the overarching story more periodically periodically, and there is a little bit more intrigue as far as that, and it leads somewhere that does feel earned to some capacity. BN2 is just a much meatier game as well. There's a good amount of side stuff and post-game content. I'd say the roster of bosses is pretty solid, although because of the way you can build your folders in BN2, a lot of bosses can be very easily exploited, which can be fun to take advantage of, but you look at Freeze Man, for instance, who is an Aquatype Navi on ice panels, and so if you're a degenerate like me and you're running a bunch of Toad Man V3s, since you can run multiple copies of 
of Navi chips in this game. He just goes down in like two of those, I think. It's ridiculous. The boss roster is definitely not as weak as BN1, although BN1's boss roster is more so weak because the Mega Buster is just super powerful. You don't really have to consider your folder setup in BN1 nearly as much as 2 and on. And so generally, I really like BN2 a lot as I've reflected on it, especially since I put in the work to get hub style. But I'm going to give this the A tier. It's not quite up in the S for me, but it is still among my favorite games on this list. And currently I have a member slash subscriber goal where when I hit a thousand subscribers or five channel members, I'll plan to stream the remainder of the Battle Network 2 and 3 post game that I have, most of which I've reserved for said streams. I am really looking forward to that, especially because Battle Network 2 does have a hard mode you can unlock, which I've never experienced because you need to actually 100% the game to unlock it. But I am very interested in that because this is one of two games in the Battle Network series that has difficulty modes, which is something I would have liked to see in the other games, but I could see myself for sure playing through BN2 hard mode once I unlock that. And what's cool too is apparently it's two separate saves, which you also can't really do in most of these games either. Now moving on to Battle Network 3, this is the GOAT of Battle Network. This is where the version split started, but in BN3 it's really not super notable aside from Giga Chips, which yeah, I know I said folder back was in BN3 white, it's actually in BN3 blue. My bad for all those months ago that I mistakenly said that, but either way, I'm still partial to white version because the differences really are pretty minor, unless you're playing PvP or something, which <laughs> if you're playing BN3 PvP, good luck. I think seeing Mario's overalls hanging up in Yai's house and seeing the ladybug thing in the playground as being blue instead of red, you know, like a fucking ladybug, is weird and distracting. I think the squirrel is a different color too. Just like little stuff like that, I don't really find the inclusion of Punk in BN3 blue to be that noteworthy. I don't really like fighting him, and you don't get anything but Zenny from fighting him anyway, so it's like kind of whatever. It is definitely better than just the dude who gives you hints or whatever, but I just don't really miss it in BN3 white. I'd also say I'm probably partial to ground style over shadow style. I did use shadow style when I streamed BN3 because I was streaming BN3 blue. When I got ground style in my BN3 white playthrough, I was really enjoying it. I didn't stick with it because I was trying to get the trophies for the other ones that I missed. BN3 story is easily the best in the Battle Network series. It's got a lot of heart. It does the overarching connected thing even better than BN2. And because this game was going to be the end of the Battle Network series originally, it does end in a nice way that feels like it ties everything together to that point. I kind of view the Battle Network series as being two trilogies, although six does of course tie back to the original trilogy as well as four and five, but we'll get there. So BN3 is S tier pretty easily. The post game is also amazing. There's like so much there. Secret area theme slaps. The boss roster in BN3 is absolute peak. I love the diversity of the bosses and even the earliest bosses in their higher level forms do put up a good fight and you probably do want to tweak your folder for each of them. I already mentioned the style change difference where you can choose to improve them without continuing to play with shitty play styles. Folder diversity is even better than BN2. This is also the point I think where you can't run duplicates of mega chips, which is like kind of a big deal because that was one of the most broken things about BN2 is being able to do that. And of course, certain program advances like Gator and BN2. I tried to avoid cheese to that degree, but I was still running like a shit ton of Toad Man 3s. The main negative I can think of for BN3 is how press and energy change work. So BN3 is when the Navi customizer got introduced. Press and energy change are both programs that you can slot into the Navi cust that are required in certain instances. Energy change is only used in Plant Man's dungeon and Flame Man's dungeon, quote unquote, which is just on the net, but you need it for that scenario. And then I don't think you ever need to use energy change again. Press, on the other hand, is a program that you need in order to traverse on certain paths on the net. I would say traversal is even better in BN3 since each area of the net is a little more self-contained, so it's easier to memorize how to get around. The undernet is still kind of sprawling, but that kind of emphasizes the danger of being in that area. My guess as to why press and energy change were required to slot into the Navi cuss as opposed to just being, you know, a key item or some kind of passive ability that you gain was to incentivize players to use the newly introduced Navi cuss, which otherwise may have gone overlooked. I mean, you can add some pretty crazy programs in there, so I don't know why you wouldn't use it, but I can kind of see the justification for requiring press, so that way players who maybe were ignoring the Navi cuss past the tutorial are reminded like, oh yeah, I have this thing where I can kind of Tetris these different abilities in here. Even then, it would have been nice maybe at a certain point in the story, press could have been converted into just a passive, or at least allow you to compress it down to like one square, so that way it's more easily swappable in the Navi cuss or something. It doesn't really ruin the experience for me, but it is noteworthy for sure. That traversal annoyance, I don't think even remotely adds up to traversing through Freeze Man's arc in BN2, for example, which I find to be a major negative for 
for BN2, whereas the rest of BN2 is pretty great. Maybe I could have used the fast travel teleporters more during Freeze Man scenario. It's still just like a lot of backtracking that is pretty annoying. That is something that is somewhat prevalent in all of these games to certain degrees. I'd say BN3 does a pretty good job of not forcing you to backtrack much, and even when you do, because each area of the net is so self-contained, I think it is a lot easier and less tedious to backtrack when it's called for. But it's also possible because BN3 was my first battle network and one of my favorite games of my childhood that I just ended up memorizing how to traverse through these areas, and so it comes easier to me now as an adult. But there is another game on this list that I grew up with that I find the backtracking to be very egregious. We're not quite there yet. Moving on to Battle Network 4, which I previously dubbed Actively Bad and put it in its own tier at the bottom. Now, I really did not like Battle Network 4 based on my experience with it when I made that initial tier list. But now, because I got all the trophies in Volume 2 of the Battle Network Legacy Collection, I've played through Battle Network 4 six fucking times. This is the only other game in the Legacy Collection that I used Buster Max for on most of those subsequent playthroughs because of just how repetitive and tedious playing through this game so many times is. But I will also say, I don't know if it's Stockholm Syndrome or what, but I feel less negative on BN4 than I used to, even though I did have to trudge my way through six playthroughs. So let me start with the good. The combat is really solid, but the combat is solid in all of these games, so it's hard to give BN4 a leg up because of that. Double Soul might be my favorite form change system in Battle Network. I like style changes and crosses as well, but there is something about Double Soul that I really like, where you have to sacrifice a chip of a certain an element in order to activate it, and then you have a limited number of turns to use it. I particularly enjoyed taking advantage of Wind Soul in BN4 Red Sun, and I would say having played both versions now, I do still prefer Red Sun pretty definitively, but this is the game where the version differences are way more notable because of the different double souls you can acquire. The thing with how BN4 is structured is that you have the different difficulty modes where you play through the normal playthrough, and then you can start a new game plus on hard, and then after doing that, you can start a new game plus on super hard, and then after that, you just continue to stay on super hard, but it's, you know, play through four, five, six, etc. and so on. And so this being the only Battle Network game with New Game Plus is pretty cool. However, the way that BN4 implements it, I think is pretty fucking poor. If you were to introduce New Game Plus into literally any other Battle Network game, it would be so superior to the way BN4 handled it. But I will say that I can see why people like this game, particularly because once you get to super hard mode, and especially so once you get all six double souls, which does require three playthroughs, the combat gets really involved and fun. But the problem is, is you're slogging your way through those first two playthroughs where it's just not because you're limited on your double soul options and because you're only fighting low level viruses and the scenarios themselves that you're doing that can repeat on following playthroughs are just like not very good some of them are okay i guess but most of them range from tedious to frustrating and i just don't really care for that aspect but once you're in the post game and you know all the bosses are spawned around the net maybe you connect your game to the other versions so you can spawn those bosses in too and you're on super hard mode with all six double souls and like all that, yeah, I could see that being a pretty good time when you're not actually playing through the game, because the story is also bad. You got this tournament set up, but like you have this other storyline going on in the background with the meteor that's approaching Earth and all that, and it just feels like super thrown together and just not very good. The storytelling in the Battle Network games is not peak by any means. I do think that 2 and especially 3 have really good stories, especially for that kind of shown in Villain of the Week kind of structure, but if we're talking grand scheme in all of video games, I'd be hard pressed to hold really any of the Battle Network stories in super high regard. It's just that 3 is definitely the closest to that. You'll see once I get to talking about the Star Force games, how those games do amp things up from a storytelling angle. The dungeons I don't think are very good either, especially because a lot of the scenarios serve as the dungeons, but you're kind of just going through the same locations constantly. You have Shade Man scenario with the toy Robocomps, which Jesus Christ, it wouldn't be so bad if I didn't play through it six times. Even though I know exactly how to do it, it just doesn't feel very good even going through the motions for that scenario. And then you get like a total non-boss fight with him. I forgot about the Radio Tower dungeon. That one's okay, but like that's also a non-boss fight. And the rematch in the Toy Robocomp, you just are given Dark Swords. That are the only thing that can damage him and like just one-shot him on at least the first two difficulties. Super hard, I think you need to use two, but it's such a non-fight and it makes Shade Man feel like such a non-threat, which I think is to his detriment in BN5. And to be honest, I wasn't really a fan of Shade Man's portrayal in BN5, even without the context of BN4 when I was a kid, for instance. And then you have Laser Man at the very end. It's really just too little too late at that point. Nebula, feels like such a non-threat, and that whole world-ending storyline is just so bad, but because I now have a post-game super hard mode save, I could actually genuinely see myself jumping into BN4 specifically for that, and having a decent time like fighting all the post-game boss fights and stuff like that, but even so, I would much rather do that in 
in most of the other Battle Network games. I say like story and structure and again the way New Game Plus and the scenarios are implemented is very bad, but the core of the combat in BN4 is really good, again especially on those harder difficulties. And so I'm actually going to give this the B tier, surprisingly. If we were ranking all these games based on just a single playthrough, then BN4 would probably still be in bottom tier, but I do think that Super Hard Mode does have its merits. I just wish that this New Game Plus difficulty selection feature was present in just a better core game. Like if you took BN3 and even just kind of slapped extra difficulty modes or New Game Plus of some kind on that game, it would basically completely invalidate the fact that BN4 has those features. I get wanting to praise BN4 for having those features. Yeah, there's additional replayability, which I find these games pretty replayable anyway, but that additional incentive of replayability is nice, but it's like replayability on a game that just is not that great. So it's a very circular kind of conversation here. I'm, I'm trying to not completely shit on BN4, because again, I do think it does have some merit. At the same time, not a big fan, and I don't think that the New Game Plus stuff saves it from its notable flaws. Now moving on to BN5, which I previously put in the S tier. My most recent memory of BN5, which I've played the shit out of over the years, mind you, but my most recent memory of it when I made that initial tier list was of the DS version, Double Team, which has a number of updates, kind of similar to BN1's DS version, where there's mystery data that contain maps of the areas, which makes traversal a little more clear, although I have most of these maps pretty much memorized at this point, so I didn't use them too, too often, although it was really helpful in the last dungeon in particular. I'd say dungeon design in BN5 is maybe the best in the series. I didn't really note the dungeons in these first four. I mean, the first game, I mean, I kind of like Color Man's dungeon, but then there's some of the worst in the series, like Iceman and Elect Man. Elect Man especially, that dungeon sucks ass. I think BN2 is probably the other contender for best dungeons. BN3 only really has, I guess, four dungeons if you count the last one, right? You have Flash Man, Beast Man, and then there's not another one until Plant Man. And like Flame Man's is kind of just on the net. I wouldn't really call that a dungeon per se. I guess you could count it, but like Bubble Man, Desert Man, and Drill Man don't really have dungeons. And BN4, I've already spoken on, there's only like three dungeons or something, and they're just not really that great. BN5, though, has a ton of dungeons. There's some that take place on the net, like Shadow Man slash Gyro Man scenario and Toad Man slash Medi scenario, but I really love the drill comp. I think the ship comp is okay. The music slaps. I really like the gargoyle comp as well, and then I really like the final dungeon, especially when you have a map at your disposal, because I did play through Double Team pretty recently to kind of refresh my memory on that. BN5, of course, has Double Soul, just like BN4. I'm much more partial to the Team Colonel Double Souls and just prefer Team Colonel in general, partially because it does make more sense narratively connecting to BN6, but also just because I like them more. Something that people like to criticize BN5 for is chip variety and therefore build versatility. And I didn't really notice it much until this recent playthrough of Double Team, where I definitely did feel the limitations, but at the same time, there still is a good amount of freedom just because of the different Double Souls you can decide to utilize. This time around in Double Team, I grinded for multiple air hockey S's, which I historically haven't really taken much advantage of. And that is a super broken strat and it's kind of cheesy, but as someone who hadn't really ever used that strat, I really enjoyed using that early game. But then as I felt like Nightman was starting to become less viable, mostly because of the close range charge shot, I started leaning more into some of the other double souls. And like, I get what people mean when they say that chip variety and like code selection and stuff in BN5 is not as good as some other entries, but I really, really like the combat in BN5 a lot. The double souls feel more equivalent in power level than BN4, where you have some total dog shit ones in BN4, and you have some extremely god tier ones as well. Whereas in BN5, I think you could make pretty much any double soul work if you really wanted to, without having to put yourself out in a major way. I think the boss roster in 5 is pretty solid. I don't think they're as varied or well-designed as BN3s, but there's just a lot of bosses that you can fight, because you not only have the Nebula navvies, which there are more than two of this time, but you also have your teammates navvies that you can rematch. And so that makes for a pretty enjoyable post-game proposition. And of course you have the Liberation missions, which I still really like. Even though there's not a whole lot of variance from playthrough to playthrough, I find that there is enough when it comes to going for one turn liberates, depending on your folder build and how you tackle things can be different from time to time. I do get why people might not be super fond of the Liberation missions, but again, I really like them. I think it's partially because you don't have to deal with random encounters in those. Like, yeah, the enemy spread is random on the field, but you're choosing to activate an encounter, which I thought the encounter rate in BN5 felt maybe higher than the other games. I can't really find any discussion on the difference in encounter rate between the Battle Network games. Some people say that it's always the same. To me, BN5's encounter rate felt higher, but that might be because BN5 is by far the most egregious when it comes to backtracking. And just like completely unnecessary backtracking that results from some bad storytelling here and there. Like, I don't think the story is bad 
bad. I like the whole, you know, building your team to go take down the bad guy, but I don't really feel like a super strong bond with the different team members. Maybe more so now that I've played BN2, for instance, which features Princess Pride and Rabita. Dusk wasn't in there, but his Navi was. And like, there's some other callbacks from the other teammates. I do feel like beyond each Navi's arc, you don't really get a whole lot out of them, narratively at least. Gameplay wise, for sure. Especially that last dungeon where you play as everyone. I think a lot more could be done with a whole team building thing with maybe more of a persona social link kind of system with the other operators, I think would make a lot of sense for this series. But BN5 is still among my favorites in this series, primarily because of the gameplay just generally, be it combat or liberation missions or dungeons. Narratively, it's fine. Not anything really to write home about per se, but a big step up from BN4 for sure. And I think you can kind of go into BN5 without having played BN4, even though Regal is the villain again. I don't really feel like you miss much. BN4 feels very much like filler compared to the other games. I will say that the backtrack in BN5 is pretty fucking rough, especially having played through Double Team, which thankfully, because I was emulating it, I could use speed up to kind of move things along. But even then, it does kind of suck. Like I know where to go and like what to do in those scenarios, but it doesn't make it any less annoying, coupled with the potentially higher encounter rate. But again, that might just be because you're backtracking more and so therefore encountering more viruses than in the games that you aren't backtracking as much in. And so with all that said, BN5 is going to go in A. It's really tough for me to pick BN2 or BN5 because I like both of them a lot. I think I'd probably still give the edge to BN5, but these are among my favorites in the series, no question. Double Team would be a contender for S because not only do you get both versions in one package, which I'm not going to rank the other versions because they're not so different that they would rank significantly higher or lower. They would just end up being right next to each other, realistically speaking. But Double Team, you do get both in one package. You do get the maps on the second screen. You do have to find the mystery data containing it, but they're usually placed pretty early in the area. You have the Link Navi system where you can like play as other navvies in battle. I actually turned this off. I found it to be in some cases too powerful and in other cases fucking me over like destroying green mystery data on the field when I obviously don't want them to be destroyed. It is a nice little additional feature. There's like the dual slot thing that changes the battle music to whatever game is in the second slot. The soundtrack is updated to the DS sound font, which definitely is a step up. I can talk about music briefly here where I've been pretty vocal about praising the Battle Network series soundtracks as being the best on the GBA by a long shot because a lot of GBA soundtracks suffer a lot from those hardware limitations. With Battle Network, because it's very sci-fi and computer focused, I think that the crunchier chiptune kind of sound really fits. Which BN1 soundtrack on the DS sounds very, very close to the GBA version, whereas 5 takes some more liberties, but generally I find 5 soundtrack to be better on the DS. And Double Team probably is the best way to play BN5 if you were trying to pick. The flexibility of the download chips and stuff is really nice in the Legacy Collection, though, I'll say. But yeah, Double Team would maybe be up in S tier, but as far as the GBA version of either version of BN5, it's got to be A because of the backtracking annoyances mainly. Now moving on to BN6, which is regarded by a lot of people as the best in the series, at least from a gameplay standpoint. I do think that I still prefer Double Souls over Crosses, but Crosses are functionally still pretty much the same. It's just how you activate them is at no cost to you, really. When it comes to Crosses, you are still building your folder around certain Crosses, ideally. Like, for instance, I put a lot of Cursor chips in my folder in my BN6 playthrough to take advantage of a Race Cross more effectively. And so that's, like, kind of the same thing as putting a lot of Cursor chips in your folder and then sacrificing one to activate Search Soul in BN5. And then, of course, the Side Beast transformation is its own thing that you can take advantage of on its own or coupled with a Cross for even more power. I'm partial to Side Beast Gregor. That's the one I grew up with. I've now played through Falzer for the first time all the way through. I still just much prefer Gregor's Crosses. And so Six's gameplay is, yeah, definitely among the best. It feels a lot faster paced in order to try to keep up with the fact that the player has these Side Beast transformations. Like, yeah, the campaign bosses are really not hard at all, but I find the SP versions of these bosses to be pretty fun to fight, with the exception of Element Man, who's a total pushover. Although I don't find this particular boss roster as enjoyable to fight as BN3s or maybe even 5 or 2s. It's really hard to say, because those boss rosters are kind of built around the tools that you have in those games. And BN6 is like kind of the same, but I just don't usually go out of my way to rematch bosses in BN6 for whatever reason. As someone who hasn't really dabbled much with the PvP element of these games, I do understand that BN6 is the best balanced when it comes to PvP specifically, but I'm talking about the games themselves, like playing through them as opposed to the PvP element. But then when it comes to the story of BN6, I actually think it's not very good. It tells its story very similarly to BN2 and 3, but I think in a worse way, mostly because you're interacting with characters that are written worse. And again, it's not like these games are written amazingly or anything. Of course, there's the infamous typos and whatnot that add to that. But like Mick and 
tab kind of suck ass and you're interacting with them for most of the story. The villains also kind of suck ass, except for Beryl, who comes back from BN5, which is why I think that Colonel makes more sense to play narratively. But like Beryl doesn't really show up until pretty late in the game. I could see an argument for like the last third of the story being solid, but really it's just that final interaction before the final boss that's noteworthy. And those few interactions with Beryl beforehand, the characters you're interacting with through most of the game are just not good, especially because Lan moved from ACDC Town, so you're not interacting with Dex, Yai, and Male. And it's not like those three were the most fleshed out characters ever, but you had hypothetically spent five games with them. And so at least there's like some connection and there's some character development, specifically in three when it comes to Dex. Not that that feels like strongly retained in the other games, but it's something. Dungeon wise, they're okay, but they kind of feel like rehashes of dungeons that were maybe done better in previous games. Well, and then the final dungeon's not unique. It's just kind of remixes of the original dungeons you did. As a first dungeon, like Blastman's is fine. Diveman's is like kind of a more dynamic version of Beastman's dungeon. Sometimes the sharks can be kind of frustrating, but it is kind of exhilarating having that action component there. A problem that exists in most of these dungeons across Battle Network and Star Force is that when you're puzzling, you can still get into random encounters. These random encounters are never a threat. They're never really that hard to run from in the games that you can run. And so it just feels like a nuisance. If you're running from a shark, for instance, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure you can still hit random encounters when you're running from sharks. There are definitely other dungeons that have similar kinds of elements where you're running or hiding from something and you can still get into random encounters, at which point you get out of the encounter that just feels like an annoying interruption. And you have to try to remember what exactly you were doing, like which direction you were heading, what was the code that you were trying to memorize or like whatever. It just breaks up the pace of the dungeons in a very negative way. But that's not a BN6 exclusive thing. Judgments I do kind of like, and the encounters interrupting isn't as egregious because you can clearly see what panels you've stepped on and which you haven't. And then Element Man's is really, you're not dealing with encounters much at all, but I don't know, it's fine. Music slaps. BN6 kind of reminds me of BN4 in a sense. I don't think that it's as weak as BN4 and the narrative isn't as bad, but it's not very good either. Dungeons are fine. And so I think BN6 is really just kind of carried by its combat primarily. And the ending I quite like. This is going to go in the A tier. I definitely like BN5 better than BN6, despite BN5's issues. But now I'm wondering if I even prefer BN2 over BN6, because I really found the story to be lacking pretty significantly in my most recent playthrough. Combat aside, I probably prefer BN2 largely. I might throw this at the bottom of A, which is still a really good ranking, but I would be hard pressed to put this anywhere close to S tier, though I wouldn't fault anyone for feeling like it does belong there. While I do think BN6's combat is probably the most refined, I don't find it to be so much better than the other games to give it a significant leg up over the other ones that do story or dungeons or boss roster better. So now we're moving on to the Star Force trilogy. I did play the first two when I was a kid, but this was around the time that I fell off of Mega Man for a little while until coming back to it in high school, I want to say. And so I'd say generally, the Star Force games handle storytelling way better than the Battle Network games. The character work feels a lot richer and more meaningful, whereas I wouldn't really pin maybe any of the Battle Network games as having super strong character work. And in some cases, like in BN4 and BN6, the character work is pretty bad, maybe with some exceptions, like I was saying with Barrel in BN6. I think this game is kind of carried by its story in a sense, because I'm not really as fond of the combat in the Star Force games as I am Battle Network. Although I'd say the combat does improve from entry to entry with Star Force. I played Star Force DX, which is an improvement patch that actually fuses all three versions together. You get access to all three Star Forces, as they're called, Pegasus, Leo, and Dragon. And even though I played DX, which has some significant gameplay changes, and in most cases improvements, I still wasn't super wild about the gameplay. I do want to say like hats off to the DX patch developers, because that is one of, if not the most impressive improvement patches I've ever seen. They took out pretty much all the touchscreen stuff and replaced it with button inputs, and also introduced some gameplay systems from Star Force 2 and even I think 3 to an extent, where like you can start battle in your Star Force form at a certain point, star cards are present, which was originally present in Star Force 2, among other things. I think the encounter rate was also trimmed down. I could rank Star Force DX specifically, there's a panel for it on this tier list, but I'm going to try to factor out those improvements from DX if I can, but I would say that even with those DX improvements slash changes, I really just wasn't that wild about the gameplay in the original Mega Man Star Force, and it's not to any fault of the ROM hack author, it's just how this game was built to begin with. I think the improvement patch did pretty much all it could. I don't like having to draw a particular card to transform. You do form brother bands with three of the characters in Star Force 1 that give you essentially a second optional transformation card, but I'm not the biggest fan 
fan of that. And even starting in it, it felt pretty overtuned being able to start in that form. There is a harder difficulty you can toggle on in Star Force DX that I didn't use because I wasn't sure what to expect. And it had been a long time since I had played Star Force. I didn't want to start things off too challenging because the perspective of the battles is like over the shoulder and you only have three potential spots you could be standing. That's just an inherent limitation on combat. There are systems in place here that do at least somewhat circumvent that, like being able to shield projectile attacks and being able to lock onto enemies and jump to them to use cards that would otherwise not reach. Generally, I don't think that Star Force's combat, as far as the way that it is set up, is as dynamic as Battle Networks. By the time we hit Star Force 3, it does get dynamic to a point where I feel like, okay, this perspective and this setup for combat makes a lot more sense. But in the first game, and even in the second game, I just don't find that it does enough to overcome those inherent limitations of the perspective and your limited mobility. I don't think that the bosses in the original Star Force really put your skills to the test in a major way. And yeah, like I was using some of the broken shit in DX. I'm not like super wild about it. It's not bad, but it gets so much better that retroactively I'm looking at Star Force 1's combat as being worse than when I was actually playing it. I'd also say that in Star Force 1 and 2 in particular, when you do go to lock on to enemies and use those mega attacks, as they're called, it's really easy to get hit out of that animation. Whereas Star Force 3's combat feels way snappier and it seems like you get at least some iframes when you jump to an enemy. So it's a little bit easier to land those, which is a very good thing because Star Force 3's enemies and bosses leverage the mechanics of Star Force way more thoroughly than the first two. And so it, it may sound like I'm really laying into the Star Force games in general, but especially the first one. But narratively, as I was saying earlier, I think these games are largely a step up from Battle Network. Star Force 1 in particular is way more focused on the characters and a lot of the character development and themes and the emotional core of Mega Man Star Force is pretty fucking strong, all things considered, especially for a game aimed at kids. Even as someone who was growing out of Mega Man, I think a lot of the storytelling stuff in Star Force 1 went over my head when I was a kid. I definitely did not appreciate that element of Star Force. It's not like a masterpiece of storytelling by any means still, but now looking at it as an adult, I'm like, damn, some of the themes that this game tackles and the way that the characters handle the problems presented to them feels very mature compared to most Mega Man games. Although something somewhat inherent to a more story focused game is that the pacing tends to slow down. I found the original Star Force to be maybe overstaying its welcome a bit by the end. Like I was finding the story to kind of drag in those last couple of scenarios, even if those themes and characters were still fairly strong. The dungeons in Star Force 1 are pretty bad though. Even removing the touchscreen stuff, they're not that great. And they range from like fine to like not good. So that's also not a plus. I'm gonna put this game in B. To me, Star Force 1 is like the antithesis to BN4, where BN4's combat kind of redeems it somewhat, whereas Star Force is the opposite, where the story and characterization carries it compared to the gameplay, be it dungeons or combat or what have you. Now, Star Force 2 does improve the gameplay. You can start combat in Zerker, Ninja, or Saurian form, whichever one you chose when you started a new game. But honestly, like, I did not really care for the boss fights in this game. Some of them were okay. Like, I like some of the optional fights, but the main fights I just found annoying, but way more so the story in Star Force 2 is just not very good. I didn't find the story to be that bad early on, but the further you get, and especially once you get to the Plessio arc and on, like, man, that shit is really stupid. It's bad. It goes for a light tone, which like isn't inherently a problem, but some of this shit is so, so dumb. The dungeons are also pretty bad. Not a big fan of the boss roster generally, with the exception of Rogue. Rogue is like the only reason that I found Star Force 2 to be enjoyable even at all. The last story boss fight that you have with him was one of the hardest boss fights I had to put up with in any of the Star Force games, including final bosses and whatnot. That shit was tough, but in a way that felt satisfying once I overcame it. And then Rogue also, the fact that he shows up in Star Force 3 means that there is a reason to play Star Force 2 to kind of get introduced to him, though generally I'd say there's not much of a through line between 2 and 3. A couple of returning characters, but the story of Star Force 2 is largely not referenced super specifically in 3. Also, the encounter rate is fucking heinous, even with a patch that lowers it, which I played with. I found it to be pretty annoying, and so I can't even imagine playing the vanilla version. So this is going to go in C. I'm not sure if I want to put it above or below Battle Network 1. Maybe Star Force 2's combat does put it above original BN1. Certainly the DS version of BN1 would be higher anyway. 
And then we come to Star Force 3. This is, in my opinion, how the Star Force games should have started when it came to gameplay. I said earlier, combat in Star Force 3 is a lot snappier. You have some iframes when you lock on and jump to enemies, so it's easier to land those in a way that isn't frustrating, because getting cancelled out of that in the first two games was just really annoying. It's got a boss roster that is, I don't think quite at BN3 level, but it's up there. It's got a pretty strong boss roster, with the exception of Club Strong, in my opinion. I think is not that great of a boss fight. Pretty much all the others are solid, and they are unique, and do warrant different strategies to an extent, although Bushido spam is so broken that like, how could you not leverage that? Noise changes were also introduced, which is very much like style changes, although it is very much like BN3 where you can only have one at a time. There is an NPC that can revert you to your previous noise change, but having to go out of your way for that is really tedious and dumb. They should have just made it like I was saying with a hybrid of BN2 and 3 system where you can have multiple, but then like choose to improve one of the ones that you currently have. I don't know. It's whatever. Noise changes are really cool though, because one of those things that you have to build up throughout battle, and then if you build it up enough, then it can carry into the next battle. It's a whole thing. I don't really want to get into the nitty gritty intricacies of it. Just know that it added an extra layer of dynamism and strategy when it came to especially building your folder that made me think, damn, if Star Force 3 was the first Star Force game, of course, narratively, that wouldn't make sense. But mechanically, if Star Force 1 was like Star Force 3, I think I would have been way more into it from the get go when I was younger, because it does take a lot more from Battle Network. I didn't talk much traversal in the first two Star Force games, but Star Force 3, is traversal a lot where you can transform anywhere and then you can access the wave roads on top of that whereas in the first two games you have to pulse in similar to jacking in in the battle network games the way that it was handled in star force one and two just felt tedious where star force three kind of fixes that dungeons are also for the first time in the star force series pretty good for the most part although the final dungeon was pretty annoying but the other dungeons were solid i don't think that it reaches the same highs as some of the better battle network dungeons but i don't really have any major complaints about them then when it comes to story we're kind of back to more of Star Force 1 style of storytelling, except without the extremely slow pace because Star Force 1 had a lot of exposition and kind of had to build Geo up as a character. Whereas in Star Force 3, there is still character development and stuff happening with Geo and friends, but I don't feel like the pacing suffers nearly as much. Yet again, there's a good amount of very heavy themes and events, and the story in Star Force 3 really goes places that I didn't expect, but I felt like it was more than just shock value. There were a handful of moments that shocked me, like, holy shit, I like can't believe that a Mega Man game went there kind of thing, which you can view my first ever playthrough of Star Force 3 on the channel. I streamed all of these games on this list on the channel, and those are available for viewing. My first instinct is to put this in S tier, and I think it definitely does deserve that for being the best Star Force game by kind of a long shot, in my opinion. It is hard for me to say after just one playthrough whether I would rather jump into a second playthrough of Star Force 3 or play through BN5, 2, or 6 again, but I'd say Star Force 3 made a great first impression at least. We'll say that there were a couple of times where I thought the writing kind of shat itself just a little bit. It wasn't anything that ruined the story or characters or anything, but it was something that took me out of the moment occasionally. But I think it would probably take another play for me to like really analyze the story a little bit more thoroughly. But generally, I would say that Battle Network fans who don't really care for Star Force that much, and if you haven't played Star Force 3, then I'd recommend checking it out, man. It really is what Star Force should have been from the get-go. It has a lot of similar systems and kind of a similar feel to the Battle Network games generally. Though I still do miss the Navi Cup. I don't think that the ability allotment system in Star Force 2 and 3 is as good as the Navi Cust. I get that they probably want to do something slightly different, but Star Force 3 I thought was better for being a little more shamelessly battle network in the form of like noise changes and the snappiness of the combat and stuff like that. Yeah, that is my updated Battle Network tier list with the Star Force trilogy included. Of course, let me know what you guys think about these rankings. What are your favorite Battle Network and or Star Force games? Are you someone who's only played one series and not the other? Is there any interest in checking out some of these games that you may not have tried? Let's talk about it. I can just run down the spinoffs real quick since I've played more of them since the last tier list. Not that there's many spinoffs, but Battleship Challenge honestly feels like it plays itself. I'm not really a big fan. 4.5 has the makings for a really solid mobile game, actually, and I still stand by network transmission just not being a very good platformer, especially for a franchise that is largely known for its platformers. Doesn't feel nearly as good as pretty much any of the Mega Man platformers, to be honest, which is kind of a shame. The music slaps, though. I do want to thank my channel members and shout out the Space Cowboy at the Super Shadow Operative tier. Don't forget to like and subscribe, of course, if you enjoyed, and I will catch you guys in the next video.